<laughs> we can't. So, guys, welcome back for another episode of the Red Line Podcast. Today, I've got the pleasure of Praveen Ganta. And Praveen owns a fractional business that focuses on, he's going to tell you anyway, but today's value is from another angle of the B2B industry. And I want people to hear a diverse source of information so that whoever watches it, they can apply it to some area of their lives where it does deliver the right amount of impact. So Praveen, let's start off with who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Yeah, thanks, Shane. And uh, who am I? Well, uh, I'm here. I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, okay. it's, uh, that's my home base. Uh, I today I'm CEO of a company called Fraction. Our premise okay. is that the best, well, really not just the best software developers, but the best employees of all kinds already have a job in today's world. Okay. And so why not hire them fractionally? And so okay. we we have created a marketplace to help uh, with, we're focused mostly on software and product, software product team related roles, but uh, creating a marketplace to help uh, companies find software developers and product managers and folks like that who are willing to work fractionally up to say uh, half time or about 20 hours per week. Um, that came from my past startup experience. And uh, I built, uh, I guess, over the course of about a decade, I built a startup that I sold in 2021. Congratulations. It was 11 years, actually. Thank you. Yeah, started that, that startup in 2010, sold in 2021. And uh, one of the things that we did that was a bit different, when we sold the company, we had about 12 software developers on our team, but five of them were fractional. So the idea came okay. from our own personal experience, meaning the idea for the current startup. We had success with wow. that. We were, you know, it's relatively rare with with technology companies and startups to be high growth and also be profitable. But we did yep. manage to achieve that. And, and that certainly helped us as we sold the business. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I so, got to where I am today. Amazing. Are you, are you, so look, again, these big numbers, exits, Raising money, all of that is my world. So are you able to share how much you uh, it got acquired for? Yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll let the viewers do the math because technically it's all NDA stuff and whatnot. But we yeah. we sold for 16 times revenue. And, uh, you know, wow. we managed to, you know, we managed to, to get our, our, our revenue. I think we exited around an 8 million run rate revenue. So, so yeah, we managed Mate. to put together a pretty nice exit. Uh, the nice Amazing. thing was that we were bootstrapped. So we had no, we had no outside capital. Um, just myself and my co-founder owned the whole business. Okay, so this is going to be very interesting. What made yours and your co-founder's relationship so successful? Because me and my co-founder, ours was successful. And then there came a time where Head started, <laughs> we disagreed. You want to go fast, you want to go slow, you want to go this way, you want to go this way, and ours mm -hmm. broke down. So it's a learning lesson. Yeah, we weren't supposed to be on the same train for this one. But what what advice would you give to those? I think starting a start with a part with a partner is great. It's a great idea. You guys can work and leverage each other. You could bounce ideas of each yeah. other, validate them. So for you, what kept you guys successful and together for eleven years? That's a long time. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like um, startups are like measured in dog years, you know, lifespan wise. So you get to like your seven or seven or eight. And it's probably you're, you're, you're ready to, uh, to be done, but uh, maybe even before that. But um, in that, in this case, uh, my co-founder was somebody that I knew I had known him for uh, probably about 10, 12 years before starting the company. So we were friends. Okay. Uh, now, of course, I could still go either way. It could end badly. Uh, but <laughs> we both had strong opinions, honestly. Well, the, the good thing was that we had very complementary skill sets. So I come from a tech background, tech and finance background. And so, you know, but I was very much building the product that we were selling. And mm. my co-founder was, uh, you know, focused on sales and, uh, and really getting the product out there. And I feel like those are the two skills you need. Like at the beginning of any mm. venture, you need to have the ability to create something of value, product or service, yep. and you need to be able to sell it market it and sell it and get it out there in people's hands. So 
uh, we had those two skill sets, and, and so that was complementary. For sure, like over the years, you know, you have your ups and downs, right? We had our disagreements. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're both, I think, can be argumentative people, but both able yeah. to just put it right behind us once a decision is made. So it just rolls I right off our back. Yeah. So, so that kind yeah, of Yeah, that's that a helped. very big thing. That's a very big thing. I think one of the biggest things in any business relationship, especially when you own a company together, is that mutual understanding that when you guys are working, the job mm -hmm. roles are speaking to each other. And that's based yeah. on data and facts. Any emotional mm -hmm. contribution should not be there. Any emotional there. Any stress emotional shouldn't stress. be there. Yeah. And I feel that's what does make it successful. And make it I successful. think that's one of the things that stopped us from being, from continuing was the emotions stuck there for my partner. And even mm. trying to say, look, just tell me, I need to know when I'm, if I'm doing something wrong, tell me if I'm, if you want to get your voice out and your word to me so I can work better with you, you have to do that. You holding it in doesn't help either of us. And um, right. we couldn't get around that. And that was, uh, that was uh, a detrimental failure. But why did you get into say, why did you get into startups? Why did you get into this tech world? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so I actually, I, I only lasted at my first job. So for context, I guess I graduated in 1999. So that was coming right Same into, you know, yeah, yeah, well, so coming right into that whole dot com era, you know, there was like, yeah. it was boom times. And so lots of startups everywhere. So it seemed like a cool thing to do. Um, when I first got out of school, though, so I started at a, at a company, a, a bank, actually, and um uh, I was kind of like in an e-commerce division. They were they were saying that they were trying to do some kind of new, cool, cutting edge stuff. And I immediately, you know, once I got in there, I was like, wow, this feels like it's moving like really slow and nothing's happening. <laughs> so I felt that like immediately, you know, it was like big company and it, it felt like, well, we're not really accomplishing very much. This is pretty easy. I guess I don't have to do very much. So I started getting bored. Um, yeah. I questioned myself. I quit within six months, but I definitely questioned myself. Um, I was like, you know, am I not just am I doing the right thing, but like, I don't know, have I made a mistake like with my life? I because you imagine you just graduated college, you don't mm. really know much. Um, yeah. But I already had in my mind ideas that I was like working on. In fact, uh, like I had already started working on ideas on the side before I even left that first job. So it was it was okay. something that was um, maybe it was always an interest that I was going to try to do something, try to build something. And when I wasn't seeing that fulfillment in that early job, I was like, all right, I'm just going to do it myself. So I quit and started working on my first startup, which was like an early version of like a Google Docs, like, you know, where you could work mm -hmm. collaboratively. This is like 1999. So the technology was way rougher, but, you know, it was like an early <laughs> version of collaborating online. Our, our really cool feature was uh, we called it Smart Comment. We thought it was such a cool feature. You could kind of put a sticky note on someone yeah. else's document. And then when okay. they came back, they see the sticky note in the same yeah. place, which was like a really big deal back then. I was is. like, well, this is like cool tech. <laughs> so, yeah, that was yeah. funny. But, uh, but yeah, that was, you know, so we, we built that. We actually sold that company. Um, you know, again, it was boom time. So this was in two, early 2000. We, um, this is kind of funny, but, um, and it tells you how much luck can play a factor in a way. So we started this company, it was called Smart Work Groups, you know, like I said, building this kind of collab early collaboration technology on the internet. We didn't have any customers, you know, we just uh, were working on the tech and demoing to like VCs thinking, you know, maybe we can raise some money. Everyone tells you that's what you're supposed to do, right? So that's yeah. all we knew. We're like, oh yep. yeah, we can raise some money. And so we started trying to pitch. I remember I actually faxed because of course fax machines were still a thing back then. I was faxing <laughs> like, a pitch letter or something to some different <laughs> VCs. But one of the VCs got it. And I guess they must have looked up the website or whatnot. And they actually, um, they put us in, well, they, they didn't reach out to us directly, but I guess they mentioned it to one of their portfolio companies. And that company ended up actually taking a look and we had a conversation with them. So it was indirect because it wasn't that company that ended up buying us, but somehow the word got out to some others and it made its way to the company that ended up acquiring us. So wow, that so, is yeah, that kind of incredible. Yeah, <laughs> random facts, you know, actually sort of made its way to the right hands. 
Wow, dude, that is that is huge. All right, so now we're gonna have to flip it because who you are and what you do and why you do it is incredible. So we got to hear about some of the other stuff along the way, and those are usually the failures. So I call it accelerated learning because I think if you fail a thousand times, you have a hundred solutions that are pretty pretty damn good and pretty solid that are gonna work. Yeah. So can you describe or identify a very very distinct failure? that happened throughout your career and that failure helped define Praveen and who you are today. I have a yeah. number of those. Which one is yours? The most, the most distinct <laughs> one for you. Yeah. I would say there's a very specific one that is part of my personality and like, yeah, oftentimes our strengths are also our weaknesses. Right. And so for me, I could say it's like that too. Um, I'll note real quick, by the way, with that first startup success, you know, we had, this was like early 2000s, so I'm not sure if listeners remember, but like the market crashed right after that. So, so we got all of the stock. We thought we sold the company for like a million dollars. Um, my stock was worth, I think, 300 bucks when I sold it. So, so basically, it was nothing. It was a good learning experience. I think I made, I made like 30 grand on the front end because some yeah. of it was cash. But by and large, yeah. it was just a good learning experience. They say, like, you know, I, there's a saying in startup in the startup world. Uh, there's three startup exits. There's sort of like enough to change your car, enough to change your house, and enough to change your life. And so this was in the first category. Wow. I made the money. I could buy. I could buy a car. That's that's what level that was. <laughs> but, uh, but nothing more. But uh, wow! And that was. Yeah. You think that was the one that helped to help make you who you are today? Well, no, no. So in terms of failure and in terms of what's core to my personality, so it's actually the second startup I worked on. I mm. learned very much in that first, you know, experience really because it was in that dot-com era. And like when you're in boom times, everything seems to go right for everybody, right? Or for a lot of people. And so you don't learn as much in a boom. You learn a lot yeah. more in tougher times. Uh, but for mm -hmm. me, my next startup, I was actually working on uh, expense management software. And uh, I had this idea that, uh, I could build the software, which I did, which would go out, it would go like to like Expedia and like all the travel sites and figure out how much travel should cost between say, I don't know, New York and Boston or actually New York and London, believe it or not, that was actually the trip that made me think of the idea because I was working in finance in New York and they would fly mm -hmm. us business class to London. And that ticket is like three grand, at least back yep. you know, from what I remember then. Yep. And you buy the economy ticket, it's like 600 bucks back then or something. And I'm like $2,400. Is it really worth it? Like, I would happily take the economy seat if I got some of the incentive, right? If you give me give me a little bit of that uh, savings. So that was the idea, was to okay. reward travelers if they were willing to save on behalf of the company. So, wow. Well, so I built that software and I did everything by myself, meaning I was building the software. I even went to a, a, a big conference of business travel executives and I pitched and did all of it. So he gave me a lot of respect for sales and learning how, like I got all these business yeah. cards at this conference and then I have like a hundred business cards that I need to, because I did a raffle. I did an iPod raffle. This dates the whole thing <laughs> because when iPods were a big deal. Yeah. So like a lot of people gave me a card to try to win the iPod. And so I had a hundred cards and I have to call and email all these folks. That's when I learned respect for sales and how hard it is. And it's, it's a real yep. job and it takes a lot of effort. It's not easy. And then you're mm -hmm. trying to wear all the different hats and it's too much. So um, what I learned, and this was my, that company failed, went under, I, I made nothing there. Uh, but what I learned was you can't be an island by yourself. You need a team. You really do. Yeah. So that was my key. And for me, I'm very much a do-it-yourselfer. And I just kind of yep. like, I'll just jump in and try to get things done. But that's a strength and it's a weakness. You, you like, if you have a tendency to keep everything to yourself, well, where's your team? How are you going to grow? You can only do so much by yourself. That's 100% true, and that was one of my biggest fails in my team. One of my mentors was always telling me, you have to let them fail. You have to let them fail. You have to let them be responsible because otherwise they'll never learn. And if you keep trying to do everything, number one, you're going to go crazy, and number two, you're going to burn out. And both of those almost took place. Um, I'm one of those people. I'm a fighter. I, do, I, I never give up. I'm quite relentless when it comes to anything I do. But... That was my biggest weakness. It was, I would ask somebody to do something and it would be, I don't know if you're the same way, but if, if I want to get something done, I'll prioritize, can it be done today? 
and get it done like very quickly in a couple of minutes or can i push it out right like the eisenhower matrix mm-hmm. really urgent not urgent important not important and that's how i'd kind of categorize most things but there were some people that were i'll do it tonight and then mm-hmm. they forget and then it's not where you and then it's not in your inbox in the morning when you ask for it or when you need it and these kind of things then started to piss me off and i got to a point where i was like i might as well just do everything myself mm. so everybody's fired i'm gonna do it myself <laughs> and it became <laughs> it was very very hard after that so that was a yeah. learning experience for me but no mate you are absolutely right you cannot you cannot run an island by yourself so that probably dovetails into the next segment and it is on i know you mentioned that was a good learning experience for you but there are usually profound learning experiences through either detrimental times or just something impactful that you went through in your life now how would you define that learn that learning experience and how that learning experience has helped you remain successful because getting right. successful is one thing, but remaining successful is a total different kettle of fish. That's that, and that and that's an interesting question. Um, well, I would start with so I had that lesson, you know, of working for a couple of years on a startup, trying to do everything myself. Uh, I got I actually got close to selling it, despite like all those mistakes. Uh, mean selling mm-hmm. that company, uh, not for a huge amount of money, but decent, given that I was the only person working on it. But that deal fell apart, and then I just shut it down. Okay, so that's mm-hmm. the wasted effort. That's the lesson. Then I looked back and I did kind of like a, I was like, what did I do wrong here? What went wrong? And I and I did at least kind of hone in on this idea of, well, where's the team? Uh, and so that's when I started my next company, which was called Hidden Levers. And that's the company that, that I sold a couple of years ago uh, mm-hmm. that I brought in a co-founder. I, I was thinking in my mind, what skills do I not have? Well, I'm not really naturally a salesperson. And so who do I know? you know, they could help fill this role. And so, mm-hmm. you know, there was a friend of mine that came to mind who was in sales and trading on Wall Street. That's what he does, right? And so it happened that the company we were going right, to, that, that, you know, I wanted to start, Hidden Levers had to do, it was finance related. It was a uh, portfolio stress testing uh, software. So it actually, you could, you could put in these different scenario questions, like what happens to my portfolio if uh, interest rates continue to rise here in the US, let's say or what happens wow. in other kinds of different scenarios and would analyze that. And so, so he, he logically had a good background to help sell that. And then it was my kind of background expertise to build it. So it seemed like a great fit. So that was kind of, you know, the learn the lesson learned and fast forward, you know, a decade or really 11 years after that, 2021, we managed to sell that business and, and, um, we, we, we fought through it in terms of, um, it just being, the two of us, I think we put $10,000 in of our own money at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But that was it. There was never any other investment. And so, um, so yeah, it was built up from there, sold the business. How do you stay successful is a great question. Um, it's been two years since that exit, so I'm not broke yet, so that's good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> like not changing your lifestyle and letting letting that you know let not letting it go to your head okay probably you know is a little okay. important yep um yep. so i like to i like to think that that you know I've, I've stayed grounded you know you can you can of course spend a whole bunch of money and do all of that but there's really no end to that you know and you start to if you if you get yourself you get yourself into trouble the moment you play the comparison game well so and so has x or so and so sold their company for y or any of that so try not to get like too distracted by all the stuff that you can see on TechCrunch you know or any of these websites where it's like all these big (laughs) deals and all this stuff you know and uh, that can be that can be really toxic so staying away from that and um, and just focusing on what uh, what I'm interested in in doing or, or working on instead okay so that that is interesting so i'm sure 90 percent of the world has that dream of getting to a place where they can become financially free and now it is a moment where you can kind of focus on yourself your inner self meditation and all the things that all these successful people tell you to focus on so what give us a walkthrough uh in the day of the life of praveen when now, in, in in now state. So, what what does a what does a typical day look like for you that doesn't include work? Yeah, that's a good question. 
Yeah, because the funny thing, my first thought is that um, in the end, like not that much changed. Like I think <laughs> you know, and so we didn't we didn't change that much in the end. Which you know, I think that's yeah. probably a good thing. But the not work, you know, what did change, which is I think you know healthier. Hey, it's healthier for I think like my life and like family life outside. So um, I've been married. I guess hey, it's almost twenty years now. Wow, that's that's crazy to think. Nineteen years. Wow, congratulations. Um, have three kids. So, um, in those really busy startup years, I have to say, you know, like my wife was definitely doing the heavy lifting. I mean, I wasn't like yeah. totally MIA, but she was doing the heavy lifting. Let's be honest here. Yeah. Since yeah. then I have been able to, like, I have, I definitely committed like after the exit, I was like, all right, I'm going to be, try to be more present than I have been. And so far I've been successful. So like I cook twice a week, you know, so I like just doing some things Good. like that, make sure I'm actually a little more, you know properly yeah. involved. Um, but then in terms of like myself for myself, the thing, and this is something I started relatively recently. So I've always been, you know, kind of into uh, working out or like trying to stay in shape, stuff like that. Yeah. Lots of people, yeah. Yeah. Different things that they like to do there. The one thing that I committed to, and this was really just since June of this year, but I'm still so far still good Been a couple months is just committing to doing some type of physical activity every day. And it's not like it has to be like okay. a whole it doesn't it doesn't have to be even if it's just five minutes where i get my heart rate up like just committing to like you know what you always have time for that like i'm not i'm not mm -hmm. setting like a really high bar for myself because i know things yeah. life gets to me but at a minimum yep. doing something so that i'm like actually active or i was active every day that's really cool man i think that is a really good piece of advice for people that are on this journey and one one thing that has uh, been important, I I paid a ton of money for this business performance coach, and the one thing he led the path he led me on was uh, on fulfillment, and I would be confident enough to say that I believe you've reached a level of fulfillment that you could possibly describe. What does fulfillment now that you've achieved, let's say, probably a, a large majority of your dreams and aspirations? How would you describe fulfillment for yourself right now or to somebody listening? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I mean, because it, it really does have to do with how you how each of us thinks about things. And I mean, lots of people do feel fulfilled, you know at various stages in life. And I feel like it's twofold. You, you know, you kind of set all these goals out for yourself. For me, at least, um, I acknowledge that, hey, you know, I, I hit this target that I had when I was younger and I, and I, and I kind of checked this box and I did this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, so I guess I'm, I'm like, what day is it? Eight, yeah, August 31st. So I'm, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks away from being 45. So- um, okay. Look very I feel good for like your I'm age. young enough. <laughs> What's that? I said you look very good for your age. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so I um so I um look back and I'm like I had all these goals and, and sure did I manage to check some of those boxes? I did, and that's great. And I remember, you know, it was a great feeling being able to cross some of those milestones and um you know, with obviously having a successful exit, all of that. But that that sort of like lasts, you know, in in your head for a minute. You sort mm -hmm. of you you feel comfortable and you're like, wow, yeah, you know, I did that, and that's that that's that's yeah. a success. But I would just be bored if I just left it at that. I'm like, you know what? I'm too young to retire, <laughs> and so so it's like, what's yep. next? And so I I honestly think, I mean, I know it's a cliche, but life is just a journey. So what's up next? You know, and and definitely set the next <laughs> set of goals. And uh, yep. it's not like there's a, an end point to it. So I, I started yep. trying to think about, yeah, what did I want to work on or do or how did I want to be impactful? Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that my wife and I did out after the exit is we created a foundation, you know, and we put, mm -hmm. you know, some real money into that. And so we have been doing more charitable giving, you know, in that way. And okay. so that's yeah. something that we, we'd always wanted to be able to do more so. And so now, hey, we're able to, so we should. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. So as we wrap up the show, one thing I want people to be able to take away from this is something that they can execute and use today and start realizing a result. So for example, let's say if I said, 
don't go by a list off of Cognizant, go by a list and get it clean, verified, validated, have it go through a week's worth of cleansing before you use it. That will save you 80% of your time, right? Just something that has been thrown off. What's one thing you could tell the audience from your point of view, how to be successful today? One thing they can start doing today differently that mm -hmm. gives them an edge over their competition. Yeah. Well, so I, um, I interact with a lot of startup founders, like early stage startup founders, uh, these days. And so what I've seen is, and this, this is funny. You'll, you'll know it's true. What I'm about to say is true because it, uh, it's in conflict with my current business. And so that's how you'll know. I'm okay. telling you the truth. <laughs> um, and that is that I think that every founder or every kind of new startup in almost every case, I mean, there's a few exceptions, but in almost every case, you should start with a no code based solution, no code or low code, because there's so many good tools out there. You don't need to pay a developer. And so this is the part that's like against like my own business, but no, you don't yep, need yep, to pay yep, a developer. Yep. And these days yep. we, when we take calls with um, really early stage founders that don't have a product yet, don't have revenue yet, they just have like an idea. We say, build it in no code first do it yourself. It's going to cost you like 20 bucks, right? And you got to put the time in, but if you don't put the time mm -hmm. in, you don't even know what you're building anyway. So uh, these tools have gotten a lot easier to use. And even if you need someone to help you through that process, that's a heck of a lot cheaper. You don't need to build software from scratch for the first version of whatever you're trying to achieve. Uh, and then get out there in front of your audience. I feel like too often, like founders will try to hide behind, oh yeah, we're trying to make the yeah. product perfect. You can't make it perfect anyway. So no, instead <laughs> get out there, you know, get out there with something that you built in no code or yeah. low code yeah. and get the feedback and iterate. And then if it looks like you really have something when you're getting some traction, then you can replace, replace it piece by piece with real code where you build a true like long-term product. And by the way, we did the exact same things ourselves. So I'm a software developer by background, but we did that exact same approach for our own business uh, with Fraction, like recently. And I would say um, what we just replaced our kind of developer marketplace that we have with a real code solution. And that project took us, you know, just to get the, the early part, the equivalent done, probably took about eight to 10 weeks to do the regular mm -hmm. software development way. The original part that I did with a no-code solution, happy to mention it here. I'm not paid to, to tout these guys, but Softer is the one we used. It's a company out of Germany, yep. S-O-F-T-R dot I-O. Yep. So theirs is really easy to use, which is why I like them. Um, took me like a week, week and a half. So about 10x as wow. fast to get something yeah. basic out the door. Does it look as good as what we have now? No, it does not. But, it, but did it work? 100%. Did we stand up the business and get going with it? 100%. We prove the business could be successful. Yes, 100%. So I think you can achieve so much that way and you can save your money and get to market faster. And honestly, test whether or not your business idea is any good or not, right? Don't spend thousands <laughs> of dollars to find out. Instead, do it that way. Do it for cheap and then and get the learnings and iterate. Because, you know, probably you're going to have to pivot a little bit, you know, yeah. do that first. Yep. Oh my God, that look, I think that's the best piece of advice we have got. My customer acquisition cost for a service related business by the end of it was 63,000 pounds. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was bad. It was bad because it took so long to get them on board, even through referrals. So by the, the, we, we've reached the end of the show, but Praveen, it has been an absolute pleasure and really eye opening to hear your story. How do people get on on board with you? How do people find you? Where is the best place to communicate with you? And if they want to, what's one specific thing they can come to you for? Yeah, I mean, you certainly you can find us. Uh, Higherfraction.com is the website. Mm -hmm. So you can easily, easily find us there. Uh, and I'm happy personally. So you certainly can find me on LinkedIn uh, as well. Uh, and I spend, you know, a fair amount of time, you know, just, giving out advice to founders. I actually write a, um, a series. This is on, on higher fraction. You'll see it. It's called profit 101. That's uh, you'll see a link to it there. Okay. Uh, but I kind of write like a series, like a blog, a blog post about how to run a profitable startup or how to try to achieve that. So I definitely, you know, kind of put that out there as well. That's awesome. Does it have any relation to profit first by Mike Mikowski? 
Um, it it's kind of it's similar, but it's it's all just kind of my own thinking and my own thoughts on the matter. But yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. Look, Praveen, again, thank you so much. Hey guys, if you guys got value out of this episode, which I'm sure you did, if you want to start up a business, what Praveen just said about a no-code solution, I think is absolute mm -hmm. dynamite. But like, share, subscribe this episode if you liked it. Praveen, stay on for one or two more minutes just so it can upload. And guys, I'll see you next week.